Hi there, my name's Jason DeLong, and welcome to Midspring at our place along the edge of the mixed forests that make up the Aspen Parkland. My channel's been dormant for a couple of years while my world's been spinning around the energy and power generation industries, but now, with the COVID-19 and energy crisis in full swing, work's been suspended for a bit. The bright side is more time for the forest, so I've tackled a project I thought my YouTube audience might enjoy. My previous episode showcased a hunting adventure with a Mossberg 590 shockwave, and along that same vein, this time, I'm going to feature the Remington 870 TAC-14 as I show you a potential process you can use to develop skills with these types of shotguns. I'm also going to take you out on a bird hunting adventure to show you firsthand how you could deploy these skills with a TAC-14 in the field. But before I get too far ahead of myself, let me show you how this gun comes straight from the factory. Here's a brand new Remington 870 TAC-14 Marine Magnum. They set it up with a 14-inch cylinder bore barrel with a simple raised bead, a Magpul Industries M-Lock MOE forend, a Shockwave Technologies Raptor grip, and a combination of stainless steel and electroless nickel plating for weather resistance and a high bling factor. In the spirit of simplicity, I've only made two modifications to my gun. I first swapped out the foreign for an old school Remington synthetic, and this is something I suggest you consider for reasons I'll show in a moment. Then I drilled some dimples to install a plus one extension. The technique I'm going to encourage you to try involves sighting down the top of the gun, meaning you have to hold it in front of your face, and with the Magpul foreend, this is kind of uncomfortably close. But with the longer length of the OEM old school Remington, I can gain a couple of precious inches of additional standoff that also creates the benefit of increased sight radius. For 12 gauge shotguns equipped with only a pistol grip, recoil can be a significant issue even when bearing down and shooting with both hands. Yikes! This is particularly true with heavier loads and if you're not careful, you might wind up taking a powerful, painful shot right to your face. When this happens, it drives people to adapt a shoot from the hip mentality. And as you can see here, this is not a technique easily learned with any form of accuracy, despite having about the highest badass factor you could ever imagine. So if you're okay with walking your shots into your target, carry on. But I propose something different. One of the great things about the 12 gauge shotgun is the wide variety of different ammunition available for it. And one genre that's seen increasing offerings in the past few years is low and managed recoil loads. Not only limited to low recoil target loads, these days there's also a pretty good selection of managed recoil slugs and buckshot. I've hunted with low recoil buck in the past to great effect, and this fall I'm planning on a big game hunt with Remington's managed recoil slugs. So for me with my TAC-14, low recoil ammo has significantly transformed the shooting experience. From a form of shooting that's painful and possibly dangerous to something fun and I think with way more potential to be effective because I can hit things and I'm not afraid to catch my gun with my face. The next stop was the welding shop where we made up some targets to use for basic familiarization and to get a feel for how my two different TAC-14s patterned. What you're looking at now is what I came up with for a sturdy yet simple, resettable yet portable hinged knockdown plate that's great because it provides instant hit or miss feedback and has no consumable costs. But if you don't mind trading the cost of clays for how great a big cloud of clay dust can be, here's a portable clay pigeon target holder along the same vein. Rather than just boring old pattern board tests, I like to get a feel for patterning shop by using a combination of these two target types. I started by setting up a static clay range in 7 yard increments. Here's a typical run from the cylinder bore of my TAC-14 Marine Mag. You can see that the resulting pattern reliably breaks clays out to 28 yards, but I struggle with a 35 yard clay and repeating the same run about a dozen times generated similar results. Occasionally I'd get a first round hit on the 35 yard clay, but most often it would take 3 or 4 rounds to get a breaking hit. Now check out this TAC-14 police build with its fixed modified choke. Next up is the same exercise, but this time with the knockdown targets to get a slightly different perspective on each gun's target effect with this combination of pattern and shot size. The fixed cylinder choke of my marine mag struggles with this long target too. 
there's just not enough pellet mass hitting with sufficient velocity to knock it over. And on almost every run, I had to move up a few yards in order to knock it over. So how well did the fixed modified choke fare on my TAC-14 police build? Let's see. There we go, and that actually hit pretty hard. So now that you've checked out your gun's pattern, let's explore some of the fundamentals of wing shooting. Up around where I live, most of the nearby clay shooting clubs have rules that unfortunately preclude the use of a gun like the TAC-14. With this in mind, we set up an affordable throwing battery at our little farm that utilizes some pressure treated timbers, a couple of C-clamps, and a few slightly modified manually articulated and operated clay throwers. They allow for a wide range of target presentation, and they cost a small fraction of what you'd pay for an entry-level automatic machine. My best friend and lovely bride offered to man the clay battery for a couple of hours, so we started out with what I think is the easiest shot to learn, a simple floating incomer. Start with your gun just off the path of the bird and a little under your sight line. As you start to see the target, make your mount by bringing the gun into sight alignment, but hold your focus on that bird. Match speed, find the line, and then pull the trigger when the speed and the line feel right. Oh. The next easiest target to learn is a target whose trajectory makes it fly more or less straight away. Oh. Start your gun just under the line of the bird and a bit back from a break point you imagine in your mind. As you see the bird, bring the gun into sight alignment and initiate movement towards the target. Just as your gun overtakes the target, that's when you pull the trigger. Oh. Once you've started to master these two shots, it's time to introduce crossing targets that will require a bit more lead. Oh. A common and effective strategy to use for this type of bird is to keep the gun ahead of the target, essentially matching its speed but with a gap of lead. As you swing, things should look like they're floating. Another principle you might want to consider is to make a strong effort to imagine the place you'll break the target, and then to set your stance to be strongest and best aligned at this point. Once you've done this, you can move your gun back to a point approximately halfway between your break point and where you can clearly see the bird. Start your gun here, but then pull your eyes back to that place where you first clearly see the bird, breathe, and call for the target. Initiate your gun movement as you see the bird, and you'll be shooting what folks call sustained lead as you then play out the plan you just made. And if a certain technique is just not working for you, don't ever be afraid to try something different. This technique is called pull-through. It involves starting the gun a bit closer to where you see the bird and to then let the target pass in front of your gun as you initiate your movement. Some feel this allows you to better see the line of the bird and it certainly generates a good amount of gun speed as you'll have to move the gun faster than the bird to get far enough in front. While I usually try to shoot sustained lead, I find that if the trajectory of the target is less predictable, then pull through will often work better. For example, this target had quite a bit of variability with respect to its height and transition zone, and I felt like if I came from behind, I didn't have to work quite as hard to fix what sometimes turned out to be a disadvantaged hold point. Now here's an example of all these skills applied to a real world problem I recently tackled with my TAC-14. Hey guys, Julia here. Sorry to interrupt my dad's video, but today we have a sponsor, and that sponsor is me. The reason that I'm sponsoring this video is because the health and energy crisis has thrown a monkey wrench into my summer job plans. So this year, my awesome job is to help my dad make and sell these targets for your 22. They're lightweight and easy to carry, and they're made from AR-400 steel, means they're never going to wear out. Set up super easy. Let's go shoot. The best part about these targets is that they're perfectly balanced, so you'll never have to go out there to reset them. Let me show you.
If you're interested in buying them, please check the link in the description. So far, these are the only two that we have on sale, but if we manage to sell 100 of them, we will release the second edition. Sorry for interrupting my dad's video. Thank you for watching my segment. Goodbye. We arrived one day at our little farm to discover that a huge cloud of crows and ravens had descended into our woods. Several hundred birds had moved in, and over the next couple of weeks, we sure enjoyed a good show. That is, until they picked the eyes out of two newborn calves and started preying on all the small fledgling birds. Worried our woods would lose all their songbird chicks, we set out to bring things back into balance. I could actually see them fly away the day the cloud of blackbirds decided staying was too expensive and moved off. And our awesome Black Lab India made for a great companion as she surprised everybody by jumping into hardcore retriever action. She got right into the effort and is a living testament to how awesome life can be when you get to share it with an enthusiastic gun dog. We brought the first few birds home to clean and cook, but despite our best culinary efforts, I have a new appreciation for the concept of being made to eat crow. It was super nasty, and despite trying, I couldn't even choke it down. Good girl. Having banished the crow apocalypse, let's now set out to explore to what extent I might be able to use my 870 TAC-14 police build for this coming season's elk and moose hunt. Rather than live with the limited penetration characteristics of buckshot, I figured slugs would be more appropriate for these large ungulates. I made my benchmark an 8-inch diameter circle, and I shot from 20 yards. From 35 yards. And finally from 50 yards. Oh no, I threw the last one. But pretty good for a pistol grip shotgun if you ask me. Here's my TAC-14 police build with a fixed modified choke. And here's the target with 8 rounds touching and that one last flyer. Based on this, I think I'd feel pretty confident to hunt at ranges up to 50 yards. So let's now get a quick feel for what the slugs are like in a non-compressible target media. While I would have preferred using ballistics gel for this, it wasn't to be with this year's budget, so I went instead with slew water pumped into a couple of old Tupperware totes. In my first attempt, I had the rear tub rotated 90 degrees to what you see here, and both slugs penetrated the entire length, never to be found. But with this longer orientation, I then recovered both slugs, and that's what you're looking at now. I believe all of the slug compression you see here happens upon firing, and it seems that the slugs hold together well while penetrating appropriately deep for moose and elk. Here's an unfired example of this classically styled hollow base rifled lead foster slug. The rifling allows the slug to safely pass through a variety of chokes, and if you check out its cross section, you can see that it's quite heavy at the front, yet with pretty thin walls towards the back. The result is that when fired, the slug compresses quite a bit to form a thick pancake that swages through the choke of the gun. How about their terminal effect? Well, if you'd like to see how these slugs perform out of the Remington 870 TAC-14 on a hunt for close-range moose or elk, please consider subscribing, as this will be my 2020 hunting adventure. And lastly, if you enjoyed this video and would like to support our channel, please consider checking out our Rimfire targets by visiting the link below.
Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.